Welcome everyone. Um, it's been a while since we had like a regular lecture, but today is the day. Um, and uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Um, I'm kind of like, can't see the video today, but I guess it's okay. Um, so today we'll be talking about networks. There's going to be a lecture on networks today, and then um, there's going to be a guest lecture on multivariate networks on Thursday. Uh, multivariate networks are just like a more complicated version of networks where you also have attributes about the nodes and edges. Um, but today we'll start off with networks. Um, and so just to kind of like keep you oriented in the terms of data set types, we've talked about tables, tablet data visualization, and now we moved on to networks. Um, and there's like, essentially you can think of there's two major types of networks, either like general networks or graphs or trees. Um, and so we'll talk about both of them today or in a, um, um, in a separate lecture if I, I can't finish the material today. So why, why are networks important? Well, networks model relationships between items. Um, items such as, for example, um, people in a social network or genes in a, let's say, gene interaction or protein interaction network, or you can think of it also as uh, kind of like um, homes and power plants in an electric network um, and so on. So networks kind of like are very generic, very general. You can like use them to model many, many different kinds of things. Um, just um, in terms of terminology, um, you'll see me using networks versus graphs, um, kind of like um, interchangeably, um, think of networks, like if you want to make a difference, um, I tend to prefer the word network because if you say graph, people also think like charts. So this is like a pie chart is a graph by some people's terminology, but the mathematician thinks about a network as a graph. Um, and if you want to kind of like um, distinguish between networks and graphs, you can think of it as that a network is a specific instance, such as like a social network or something like this. And graph is the generic term uh, that is used um, in like mathematics or in computer science um, as graph theory and so on. But they mostly refer to the same two things. Since in visualization, we often or mostly work with real data and not trying to prove something general about a graph, I tend to prefer the use of networks. So I want to start off with you thinking a little bit about um, network representations. And that's why I have like posted this link to the chat and also to Slack uh, about this network exercise. And so I'll open up a couple of breakout rooms um, and, and then like just take a pen and paper or, or an iPad or try to draw somewhere else to try to sketch two different networks based on the data that I'm providing you here and is also in, the, in, in this linked document. Um, so I'll give you guys five minutes. I'll see you back at 1236 here. And so let me just start breakout rooms. Here we go.
Sorry, I accidentally exited my room. <laughs> That's again, it happens. <laughs> Okay, we should have everybody back. Um, great, so um, so in this exercise, I'm sure that like most people came up with something like this, right? Like a, a, a classic node link diagram um, where you have like the names of the people and attributes about those people in let's say brackets or some visual encoding and then some visual encoding for the edges, anybody? Had something like this? Actually, uh, yeah, I actually had a question yeah, about this. Similar like that, yeah. Sure, go ahead with your question. Uh, yep, yep. So, so like uh, we did come up with something similar like this, but there, there was a, there was a question of should we subtract out the edge weight from the node, or should we should we leave it? Because it could be uh, misinterpreted as you have to add the edges to the node um, and, the, and that equals the total. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think that um, in that case, um, like it's not in the data, but you could maybe do some, like here, I didn't do any fancy visualization, right? I'm just like basically showing the numbers. Uh, maybe if you do a visualization here that you, for example, show the edges, um, the numbers for the edges of thickness, um, and then it might be less of an issue. Oh, okay, thank you. So yeah, um, this this kind of visualization is is great for answering, for example, the question like how is Sean connected to Sylvia, right? We we essentially can go through like okay, here's Sean, um, and then here we have a connection to Alex, and then to Mark, and then down to Sylvia. So we can kind of like trace this path here fairly easily. Um, did anybody um, like, well, we can also ask questions like who has the most connections in the network? That's also like fairly easy to read here. We can see that this is like the central node Alex here. Which two authors collaborate the most? Um, it's also like mm -hmm. just nice to see. Um, we have like a connection here between Alex and Mark with 24. Um, and then who is only loosely connected in the network? We see that there's Carolina and Sylvia who are kind of like dangling more or less. So it's kind of a good representation uh, of this network. Did anybody use the table? Yeah, we did. We used the adjacency matrix. <laughs> yeah, so some people might have created an adjacency matrix. And like, this is the idea. Oh, I need to stop annotating. This is the idea of an adjacency matrix, right? And so um, that's kind of like the second big network visualization um, idea. So you have uh, the nodes in the rows and in the columns, and then the cells are filled in if there's an edge between them. Um, and then you, in the cell, you can actually visualize an attribute. So in this case, it's the edge weight, like we have two edges between, or an edge with weight two between Carolina and Alex, uh, an edge with a weight seven between Sean and Mariah. And so if you look at these questions in this chart, the first question, how is Sean connected to Sylvia, is almost impossible to solve in this particular visualization. You would have to really start thinking very closely, OK, like Sean is connected to Mariah. Let's see whether Mariah is connected to Sylvia. No, I can maybe guess that Mariah is connected to Al, like Mariah is connected to Alex. Maybe Alex is connected to Sylvia. No, he's not. Um, is Alex connected to? Mark, uh, yes, he's connected to Mark. Now we can kind of like start looking and Mark is connected to Sylvia. So we kind of like have to almost like take a pencil and, and, and draw explicitly if we want to make any kind of inferences about some distant connection. But what's super easy to do is uh, to see things like who has the most connections in the network, right? We see that there's the most filled in cells here. So this is kind of like very easy to spot. Um, which two authors collaborate the most? Um, we can see the 14 here. And if we had like a good visual encoding, something that is maybe pops out nicely, um, and not just this number here, uh, we could maybe see that very quickly, which is the 
the edge with the highest weight. Uh, who is only loosely connected to the network? That's also easy to spot. We can just look over all of the rows and identify the rows that have no or few neighbors. And so we have Sylvia here and Carolina here with only a single neighbor. Um, and so uh, the point of this exercise is to get you thinking a little bit about the pros and cons. But for the rest of this lecture, um, we will be talking about these two techniques a little bit more formally. And then we'll also be talking about trees. I have a quick question for this matrix. How do you feel about also adding a color coding in terms of the weights of the numbers? And to easier spot, you know, the, the heat, exactly. so to say? Exactly. So that, that, is a, uh, that is like something super common to do that we can now um, color code, for example, the cells um, to show how, how, how um, high an attribute is. And, and I'll, um, we'll talk about this in detail on Thursday. Okay, so now let's take a step back. Um, I already mentioned social networks and electrical networks, but networks and graphs are, are really everywhere, right? Um, like the internet is one big network. Uh, we have algorithms like network algorithms such as PageRank, which are used to um, kind of search the internet or to like index the internet. We have like uh, electronic circuit diagrams, which are of course networks. We have road networks, and then we have kind of like applications such as pathfinding in road networks that enable us to do navigation on our phones or on any other devices. Um, and then, of course, we have like social networks such as uh, Facebook and um, Twitter, which are like great for, let's say, sociologists to study um, various effects of how people, uh, of how like ideas emerge or how people interact. Uh, but they're like, there's also social networks in real life, right? You can capture who are my friends, um, and, and, and you can do that manually and then kind of like understand uh, complex uh, things. And this can be, for example, very important for health. So for example, in, in cancer, we know that people that have like a strong social network tend to have better chances of survival than people that are isolated. So studying these kinds of social networks has lots of implications. Um, here is like a, a visualization of the Facebook connectivity graph. Uh, one thing that you can spot here fairly easily is, well, China is missing, right? And Facebook isn't, is blocked in China. Uh, but overall, this is like, it's more of like a, a map. It's not that I can learn a ton about the topology. Maybe what I can see is that the UK and the US seem to be well connected and Hawaii is also well connected with the continental United States. But more or less, it's kind of like a heat map of where are Facebook users um, at home. Um, biological networks are super important. We have things like interactions between genes or proteins and chemical compounds. Um, you can think of, the, of your whole brain as like one big network. Um, this is all about connections between neurons. Uh, you can think of the, your ancestry as one big network, the relations between, you know, between you and your family, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your siblings, your aunts, and so on. All of the studying that is, is very important for uh, like for entertainment or just like if you if you're interested in when uh, in your genealogy you can do that with various tools but it's also very important for for medical cases and then we have the tree of life uh, phylogenies the evolutionary relationships of life like how did species evolve what are the traits of species um, and so on all of these are also very exciting network questions and these networks are super super complex this is like a a poster and that kind of represents the knowledge of the metabolic network around the year 2000. And that's kind of like a wall sized poster where you walk up and then can understand like what is going on, what are the relationship between these kind of like meta metabolic products. Um, and so you kind of use this like you used to use a paper map uh, where you have some kind of like a, 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 an, ex an extra folder that gave you like the coordinates where you would find one particular compound or something like that. Uh, now we have like digital tools that do some of this. And so I want to play this short video here um, about the importance of networks for health. For me, this story begins about 15 years ago when I was a hospice doctor at the University of Chicago. And I was taking care of people who were dying and their families in the south side of Chicago. And I was observing what happened to people 
and their families over the course of their terminal illness. And in my lab, I was studying the widower effect, which is a very old idea in the social sciences, going back 150 years, known as dying of a broken heart. So when I die, my wife's risk of death can double, for instance, in the first year. And I had gone to take care of one particular patient, a woman who was dying of dementia. And in this case, uh, unlike this couple, she was being cared for by her daughter. And the daughter was exhausted from caring for her mother. And the daughter her husband, he also, his wife's exhaustion. And I was driving home one day and I get a phone call from the husband's friend calling me because he was depressed about what was happening to his friend. So here I get this call from this random guy that's having an experience that's being influenced by people at some social distance. And so I suddenly realized two very simple things. First, the widowhood effect was not restricted to husbands and wives. And second, it was not restricted to pairs of people. And I started to see the world in a whole new way, like pairs of people connected to each other. And then I realized that these individuals would be connected into foursomes with other pairs of people nearby. And that in fact, these people were embedded in other sorts of relationships, marriage and spousal and friendship and other sorts of ties. And that in fact, these connections were vast and that we were all embedded in this broad set of connections with each other. So I started to see the world in a completely new way and I became obsessed with this. I became obsessed with how it might be that we're embedded in these social networks and how they affect our lives. So social networks are these intricate things of beauty and they're so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous in fact, that one has to ask what purpose they serve. Why are we embedded in social networks? I mean, how do they form? How do they operate? And how do they affect us? And so my first topic with respect to this was not death, but obesity. And I suddenly, it had become trendy to speak about the obesity epidemic. And along with my collaborator, James Fowler, we began to wonder whether obesity really was epidemic and could it spread from person to person like the four people I discussed earlier. So this is a slide of some of our initial results. It's 2,200 people in the year 2000. Every dot is a person. We make the dot size proportional to people's body size. So bigger dots are bigger people. And in addition, if your body size, if your BMI, your body mass index is above 30, if you're clinically obese, we also color the dots yellow. So if you look at this image right away, you might be able to see that there are clusters of obese and non-obese people in the image. But the visual complexity is still very high. It's, it's not obvious exactly what's going on. In addition, some questions are immediately raised. How much clustering is there? Is there more clustering than would be due to chance alone? How big are the clusters? How far do they reach? And most importantly, what causes the clusters? So we did some mathematics to study the size of these clusters. This here shows on the y-axis, the increase in the probability that a person is obese, given that a social contact of theirs is obese. And on the x-axis, the degrees of separation between the two people, and on the far left, you see the purple line. It says that if your friends are obese, your risk of obesity is 45% higher. And the next bar over, the orange line, says if your friend's friends are obese, your risk of obesity is 25% higher. And then the next line over says if your friend's friend's friend, someone you probably don't even know is obese, your risk of obesity is 10% higher. And it's only when you get to your friend's 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 friends that there's no longer a relationship between that person's body size and your own body size. Well, what might be causing this clustering? There are at least three possibilities. One possibility is that as I gain weight, it causes you to gain weight, a kind of induction, a kind of spread from person to person. Another possibility, very obvious, is homophily, or birds of a feather flock together. Here, I form my tie to you because you and I share a similar body size. And the last possibility is what is known as confounding because it confounds our ability to figure out what's going on. And here the idea is not that I, my weight gain is causing your weight gain, nor that I preferentially form a tie with you because you and I share the same body size, but rather that we share a common exposure to something like a, like a health club that makes us both lose weight at the same time. And when we studied these data, we found evidence for all of these things, including for induction. And we found that if your friend becomes obese, it increases your risk of obesity by about 57% in the same given time period. And there can be many mechanisms for this effect. One possibility is that your friends say to you something like, you know, they adopt a behavior that spreads to you, like they say, let's go have muffins and beer, which is a terrible combination. Uh, 
but you, you adopt that combination and then you, you start gaining weight like them. And another more subtle possibility is, is that they start gaining weight and it changes your ideas of what an acceptable body size is. And here what's spreading from person to person is not a behavior, but rather a norm, an idea is spreading. Now, headline writers had a field day uh, with our studies. I think the headline in the New York Times was, you know, uh, are, are you packing it on? Blame your fat friends. <laughs> what was it? Okay, I'll um, stop here, but I think you get the idea of how networks have an influence on us. And this is, this is true for all kinds of networks. And so they, the networks are really about modeling relationships. And so now uh, let's talk a little bit about graph theory fundamentals. Um, there's a book that I recommend if you're interested in that uh, there uh, by um, Albert Laszlo Barabasi and it's called Network Science. And we are also in the School of Computing, we also have a graph theory um, course that's taught by Blair Sullivan. So if this is your thing, um, that's definitely something that you want to look at. Um, but so where does this all come from? So there's um, the, the historically first graph problem was the Königsberg Bridge problem. Um, Königsberg is a city uh, that is historically in German, uh, historically German, but is now Kaliningrad in uh, a, a Russian enclave. And so back at the, in the day, um, um, uh, Königsberg had these, this like island um, that is, was made up um, by a river running around it. And then there were seven bridges connecting to that island and to this other island that you can see here on the, on the right. And um, people have kind of like been speculating whether you can take a walk that would lead you over each bridge exactly once without ever retracing your step. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of graph theory. And then Leonard Euler came along and, and kind of like thought about this more deeply um, and, and kind of like by doing so was the first person to kind of like think about graph theory. Um, and so the first thing that he did is he basically reasoned that it is completely irrelevant uh, which route you take on the islands or on the streets. And so the only thing that matters is kind of like the order of the bridges you cross. And so you can simply treat uh, each kind of landmass as a node and the bridges as abstract vertices. Um, and so now you've reduced this problem to a graph problem. And then he showed that uh, this is only possible with a graph with at most two nodes with, odd, uh, with an odd number of links. This graph though has four nodes, all with odd numbers of links. And so you can't do that. And so if you, if you try to do that, you will fail. It's, it's not possible to do it. Um, and so here is like a, a graph that um, where we can actually do that because we have only two nodes with an odd number of links or less than two nodes with an odd number of links. Uh, um, and, and hence we can actually uh, traverse this graph um, and visit each, each vertex uh, without uh, visiting, like without traversing an edge more than once. And so this is kind of related to the Homo Hamiltonian path problem. Uh, so a path that visits each vertex exactly once. And so that was kind of like the founding, uh, the founding piece of graph theory. Um, let's talk about some terms for graphs. So um, we, we call like a graph um, that consists of a set of vertices, uh, which we also often call nodes. So vertices and nodes are interchangeably. And the set of edges, which we also call uh, links connecting these vertices or nodes. And so here on the right, you see like a typical graph. Um, and then we distinguish between like general graphs and simple graphs. Uh, a simple graph is a graph which contains no multi edges and no loops. So this here would be a general graph, but not a simple graph because we have um, we have multi edges um, and we have self edges. Um, a directed graph is a graph where you distinguish between like the, uh, whether an edge is connected from A to B um, and from or from B to A. Can somebody give me a social network example for a directed and for an undirected network, like a digital social network? Uh, like relationships, like parent to child? Yeah, no, I mean like, okay, Facebook, for example, uh, like I, hear, I see in the chat here, Twitter is directed and Facebook is undirected, exactly. Like on Twitter, you follow uh, somebody um, whereas on Facebook, you become friends and friendship 
is mutual. So this is kind of like a difference between those two social networks. And the relationship between parent and child is, of course, also uh, uh, like an example for a, a direction. Yes. Um, hypergraphs are kind of a special type of graph where an edge um, connects not only two nodes, but the same edge connects multiple nodes. Um, this is actually something that's easier for me to think of as sets. So these elements, like if you think of these people are connected by a hypergraph, it's not actually edges between them, but it's like they all go to the same school or they all go in the same class or they're all in the same. And so these are kind of like hyper uh, edges, uh, examples for hyper edges. And hypergraphs are also fairly interesting for, for, for data visualization. Um, we can also like have some, uh, some other terms like an independent set, which is a graph that contains no edges. Um, a click is, uh, contains all possible edges, so it's completely connected. Every node has a connection uh, to everybody else, or to every other node. Um, then we can have unconnected graphs where we have components of the graph that are not connected. Um, and so you cannot trans uh, you cannot visit each vertex by just transversing along edges. Um, and then one important feature of graphs are like these kind of special nodes that we call articulation points. These are vertices which, if you were to delete them, they would break up a graph into multiple subgraphs. Um, and so here on the right, you can see an example where the articulation point is in red. And this is kind of important, of course, if you have something like the internet or an electric network, you always want redundancy. Um, and so you never want that if one server or something like that goes down, that your network suddenly becomes disconnected. Um, and so studying these articulation points and how important is a particular point, how many routes go through it, is an important, uh, an important aspect of analyzing networks. Um, then uh, we like a specific term for um, a graph that doesn't have any articulation points is a biconnected graph. Um, and then uh, another special type of graph, which is actually uh, fairly common, are bipartite graphs. So this is um, a graph where you can vert, uh, partition the vertices into two independent sets. And there's connections only between those two independent sets. Um, and that's, um, that's something that's fairly common if you have nodes of different types. So here on the right, I'm showing you like U and V. Um, but think of it as, let's say, people and uh, their research papers that they write. So you have, like, you've, you're an author of a research paper. That research paper also has another author, but you don't have connections between authors, for example, in such a network. Um, and then a special type of graph or a network is a tree. Um, a tree is, in its simplest form, a graph with no cycles. Or you can think of it as a collection of nodes. Uh, or that contains a root node and zero to n subtrees. That's kind of like a recursive uh, definition. And the subtrees are connected to the root by an edge. Um, and so trees don't strictly have to be rooted, but in practice, um, they are frequently are rooted. Uh, but it does, it, like you can also re-root trees. Um, but, but strictly speaking, it's just a graph with no cycle. So, like the, the figure on the left is kind of like what you think of as a tree, maybe intuitively, but the figure on the right is also a tree, but you could kind of like pick your root to be, let's say, either this node, or you could say, this is my root, or you could say, this is my root. All of these would be legitimate nodes. And sometimes it's useful to re-root trees dynamically. Um, and then for trees, you can also distinguish on whether they are ordered or not. Um, that is usually very important if you have some kind of like use a tree for a data structure to, that you use to like do some efficient algorithm on top of it. So in an order tree, the order of the nodes here matters. Like EFG on the left is different from the order FEG on the right. And, and hence, if these are order trees, those are different trees. If we don't consider them order trees, they are actually the same tree. Topologically, they're identical. Um, and um, there's like lots of like graph theory is, is, a, is a, an old and a big field. Um, and people um, have kind of like described these different types of graph classes. For example, in a survey here that mentions over 1,000 different graph classes. But I don't think we need to go into more detail here. So some important metrics about networks are 
uh, the node degree. Uh, so the node degree is the number of edges that con connecting a node. Um, so if you have, so like in the example here, we have this node here has a degree of three because we have one, two, three edges, right? This node here has a degree of one because we have only a single edge. This node here has a degree of two. Um, if you have a directed network, you only, you consider separate in and out degrees. Um, and it's often quite useful to kind of like calculate, like, like an average degree of a network is a useful metric to kind of understand how connected it is. Um, and also looking at the degree distribution is something very useful. And for the network in A here, we have like a, dis a dis degree distribution as shown in the histogram on the right. We have like uh, a quarter of the nodes have uh, uh, a degree of one, a quarter of the nodes have a degree of three, um, and two and the half of the nodes have a degree of two. But you can also create like a ring-like network at the, at the bottom here where you have like all of the nodes exactly of degree two. Um, and so here is like a real network, like a protein interaction network. And what you can, and on the right here, you see the degree distribution of that network. And what you can fairly easily spot here is that like low degrees here on the left, high degrees are on the right. Uh, the number of nodes with a degree are on the, on the y axis. And you can see that like most nodes here have a fairly low degree. Um, and then a few nodes have a very high degree. And that's kind of like a property that we see a lot in networks. Um, that's called like, especially in these networks that are called scale-free networks, um, that we have these central hubs, these kind of nodes that connect um, very tightly. Think of this as in a social network of like the most popular of your friends probably had on Facebook probably had like 2,000 friends. And so this would be like a person uh, that had lots and lots of connections. Um, and that, that is fairly common in, in many kinds of networks. Um, network degree is a measure of local importance, not of global importance. Um, so here is a, a social network out, out of the Le Miserable uh, book. Um, and um, it kind of like with the network here is whether those two people kind of co-occur in the book or interact in the book. Um, and you see that the, the main protagonist, Jean Valjean here is like in the middle and the nodes here are sized by the degree. And so you can see that he's like very connected. Um, and then, but there's also other uh, people like Muriel here who kind of connect to lots of people on the outside. So there's, they have some local importance, but generally Muriel is not very central to that network. Um, sometimes, uh, well, uh, one thing that you like also want to study in, uh, in, in networks is path and distances. So a path is a route along links. Uh, the path length is the number of links that you have to uh, traverse uh, to get between two nodes. And the common problem is to find shortest path connecting nodes i and j with the smallest number of length or with the links that have the overall smallest weight. And we have various algorithms like um, Dijkstra's algorithm, for example, is, 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 is uh, a common algorithm for weighted networks, or you can do something like breadth first search or depth first search for unweighted networks. Um, and then we can also call it, uh, we can also, another useful metric about um, graphs is the diameter of a graph. The longest, shortest path within G is what we call the diameter. Um, as I said earlier, um, the node degree is a measure of local importance. Um, and if I emphasize local importance, it's not, um, we, we can kind of conclude that there's also a measure of global importance. And one measure of global importance in a network is uh, between the centrality. Uh, and between the centrality is calculated by measuring how many shortest path between all possible nodes pass through a given node. So you can see that here, like um, this is kind of like, uh, if you look at the network, we see that compared to our degree, um, compared to our um, degree network that these nodes down here, they are suddenly not very important because they are, they have a lot of connections. They have a fairly high degree, but they are there's lots of alternative to go um, through if you um, if you are looking for shortest path. Whereas Valjean, of course, as the central node, has a very high between the centrality and Muriel because she connects all of these outlying nodes here. All of those nodes have to go through that node, 
and therefore she has a very high uh, between the centrality. And so between the centrality is a good measure of an overall relevance of a node in a graph. Um, and if you compare that, you will have like, if you have these kinds of histograms, so you see that um, between the centrality values are even more kind of like heavy on the, or, or have like a, a long tail uh, than, um, than degrees, uh, which is kind of not, not surprising given what I just showed you. Okay, so that's, that's it on the background for network uh, or graph theory. And now let's talk a little bit about network and tree visualization. Um, as always, uh, we have data and tasks. So network data, and then we have things that we want to achieve with those network data. And then we can kind of pick graphical representations that are suitable for a particular data set and are, uh, and, um, are suitable for achieving a particular task. And so we'll have to look at networks um, through these two lenses. What is the data and what are the tasks that we want to achieve with it? Um, and uh, the tasks, speaking of tasks, there is like this nice paper, um, this task taxonomy for graph visualization by Bong Xin Li uh, uh, and uh, co-authors um, that is about kind of like systematically analyzing what are the kinds of tasks that you would want to do in a network. And uh, examples of that is like identify a node, uh, find connections, find path, and so on. So kind of things that we uh, already talked about in theory. But generally speaking, we have two different kinds of tasks or goals. We have like attribute-based tasks and topology-based tasks. Um, attribute-based tasks are about like the node or edge attribute. So for example, find the node with the, like find in the social network, find the, the person that either is the oldest or has the highest connectivity. Topology-based task would be things like find all neighbors or find a cluster or find path and so on. So topology-based tasks, purely network structure, attribute-based tasks is about attributes of the nodes or derived attributes of the nodes and edges. Um, and in terms of network visualization, we have um, three major types of network visualization, and all of the others fall into these classes. Um, the first one is explicit or node link layouts, which is kind of like the most common one. Um, then we have matrices, adjacency matrices, and then we have implicit layouts where we have where edges are not shown explicitly. Um, and these implicit layouts, they are only useful for trees. Um, and so we'll talk in, uh, about them in the order and we'll start off with explicit networks. And so the classical explicit graph representation is your node link diagram where your vert vertices are points and your edges are lines or arcs. Um, and this seems easy and um, like well understood. Um, and, but we can, there's a couple of different ways you can create those layouts. So first you could get, create layouts without any restrictions. You could have like a completely free layout, um, but you could also have some kind of style layout. So you could have like a, a reason to arrange your nodes in a particular order. And two examples I'm showing here for the style layouts are the nodes are arranged in a circle or the nodes are arranged in a grid and then the edges are, are kind of shown on top of that. And, and as you can already see, this kind of like reduces our degree of freedom we have in, in kind of like arranging things. Um, and hence it's, a, it's, it's kind of like, well, easier to compute, but maybe not as good for some particular aspects. And then we also have fixed layouts. Um, sometimes we wanna show networks in, on top of, uh, let's say something like a map where we have points that we can't really move around. Um, so if you wanna show how people move from, let's say city to city, um, on a map, we can't really move those cities around if, if we have decided them, that the map is important. And then we have to like think about, well, what are the ways we can ideally represent this given this very strong restriction that I can't move my nodes around. Um, so in the case, in the first case where you have free layouts, we can come up, or in all cases actually, but most useful for the, for the free layouts, we can, up with, can come up with criteria for what makes a node link layout good. Uh, for example, you want to minimize edge crossings. You want to minimize the distance of neighboring nodes. So for example, you don't want to, two nodes that are uh, connected to be at the opposite ends because then you have to draw a very long uh, line that might cross over other stuff. 
you want to generally minimize your drawing area. Like it should fit on a screen or on a sheet of paper. Edges should have roughly the same length. You don't want to bend edges too much. You want to maximize angular distances between different edges. Uh, you want an aspect ratio of about one. It's like an, a network layout shouldn't be create super long or super wide layouts. And then you would you also want symmetry. So for example, if you have a particular pattern in a network, you, you ideally want this to look the same in all of the different instances. So uh, symmetry is an important property. But of course, if you think a little bit about this, you will find that these are often clicked. So here are like examples on the top left here, we have a network that has no edge crossings, um, but it kind of violates this uniform edge length principle. We have like this super long edge here. If we want to kind of like optimize for uniform edge length, we can do that like this, but then here we have an edge crossing here. So that's kind of like um, a trade-off we will always have to make and all of these different things um, have similar trade-off. Uh, here, for example, like, uh, having uh, like maximizing angular distance between the edges is in conflict uh, in conflict between symmetry like here you have a tree where a root has three nodes and then here you have also a root and three nodes uh, but they look fairly different if you want them to be symmetric you have to do it like this and so here you kind of like change angular distance and you change space utilization um, and so again uh, a trade-off that you have to make Um, and, and so like, how can we kind of like um, now create these layouts computationally? Um, so like one, um, one approach to do this is to formulate the layout problem as an optimization problem. So you could kind of like um, convert these layout criteria, like minimize edge crossings, minimize uh, edge bends or, uh, or um, minimize distances between adjacent nodes. Um, and you could kind of like um, write that down in a weighted cost function. Um, and then you could use something like a standard optimization technique, such as simulated annealing, to find a layout that minimizes this cost function. And then you can tune your layout by tuning kind of like your weights. So you could say edge crossings is like avoiding edge crossing is more important to me than uh, using drive space. And so you can play around with this and you can find like as a human, uh, a layout that works for you. Uh, a more common approach, like simulated annealing is, is fairly common for, for layouts, but the most common approach is clearly force-directed layouts. Um, and, and the idea behind the force-directed layouts is that we have, we use kind of like a physics model where edges uh, that connect two nodes are serve as springs and vertices or nodes are these repulsive magnets. And so, Nodes try to push away from each other and edges pull them together. Um, and by using that model and kind of like iterating over that model, uh, we can create layouts. And that's kind of like when we talked about uh, layouts, network layouts in the D3 lecture, this is the model that D3 also uses. Um, and so um, how like intu intuitively, this is fairly clear. Um, let's look at how does this work algorithmically. So you would start off by placing vertices in random locations. And then you would have some kind of like term um, that measures equilibrium. So for example, equilibrium could be something that like no no or no node moves at all. Like that means we have reached equilibrium. Um, then in, uh, in this while loop, um, while we haven't reached equilibrium, we calculate the force on a vertex. And the force is the sum of the pairwise repulsion of all nodes. Uh, which is kind of like you have to compute um, the repulsion uh, between each pair of nodes. That means it's n times n operation. So that kind of already gives you a hint that this isn't going to be super fast. And then we have uh, the attraction between connected nodes. And so that's kind of like the force that is acting on a particular vertex. And when you have the force, you move that vertex by um, a constant multiplied by that force. Um, in, in the direction of the force. Um, and that's the idea. And you keep doing that until you reach equilibrium or some other termination criterion, like an absolute number of um, iterations. And so this is what this looks like. Um, if I initialize the network, we kind of like quickly go through these iterations and then we get into some kind of equilibrium. So, 
So what happens if there are no links? It's kind of like um, fairly easy to say since they're all repulsing each other, um, then the nodes are simply like going away from each other and they, they do so in, in like a very regular fashion. So let's think a little bit about the properties of these networks. Um, these general, uh, these, this, this force directed network layout algorithms generally just produces a fairly good layout. Um, it, it, it kind of enforces uniform edge length pretty well. Um, it is pretty good at visualizing clusters and clusters are a very important features that uh, people care a lot, a lot, uh, a lot about. Um, a downside is it's not deterministic because we have some like random uh, in today here. And the downside is also that it's computationally fairly expensive. So since we have like n squared, uh, we have to compute the, the weights um, or the, the, the repulsive force between all pairs of nodes in every single step. We have n squares for every single step. Um, and then uh, in, in practice, it takes about n cycles to reach equilibrium. And so we have n to the power of three um, um, uh, as our big O run runtime estimate. Um, and so, um, other, like basically what that implies is that like on a modern computer in a web browser, like uh, you can do this interactively and without like uh, any big drawbacks with about a thousand nodes. But if you have more than a thousand nodes, then you have to like, then it gets slow and it will take a couple of seconds to render and, and calculate it. And, but there's lots of networks that are bigger than a thousand nodes. Um, what in the simple force directed layout algorithm that I showed earlier, I have also ignored a couple of additional aspects that you in practice always want to have. Um, like you want some like center of gravity so that your like network stays in the middle that you pull all the nodes towards. So that's also an additional force that you need to consider. Um, and then you want some damping um, kind of like um, to uh, make sure that you don't get into like extreme, um, like in, into cyclical um, kind of like push hit there and back and so on. So. Um, these are things, and there's other parameters that you can play around with um, that you can, like this is these, this exposes kind of like a different D3 um, parameters. One other thing that is very common is to like prohibit collision. Um, like if you don't do that, um, I can actually get like nodes that are overlapping. Well, there's still, there's another parameter somewhere here um, that avoids that, but um, if you, if you don't prohibit collision, you can have an overlapping node. So that's also an important piece. If I can change the charge of the repulsive forces, um, I can um, change the link distance. Um, I can like change things like the number of iterations and so on. And so you can uh, play around with this to explore these different D3 parameters. So while these node link diagrams are useful for smaller networks and are easy to read and everybody understands them, they very, very frequently like result in these kind of like giant hairball pictures. Like here we have like a network, a protein interaction network, and you really can't see much structure anymore. You can't tell whether there's clusters. Uh, so it's really just like, the, this is more of shock and awe um, like my network is big and complicated and like this researchers often call this the giant hairball because it essentially is, resembles a giant hairball. Um, one approach to address scalability problems is um, to use multi-level approaches. So intuitively, um, if you were to run this force directed layout algorithm, uh, the repulsive force between a node that is very far away from you uh, maybe it doesn't matter so much. Um, and so one way to kind of like reduce this is to do a pre-processing step where you look at nodes that are in your neighborhood where you kind of create clusters. So you run a clustering algorithm on a network, you create clusters, and then you only do this pairwise force um, simulation within the nodes of your cluster. And then you treat the clusters themselves as nodes and do like a, uh, the force calculation between these clusters. And so that kind of reduces the, uh, reduces the computational complexity uh, by quite a bit, which is useful if you have very large networks. Um, 
and an alternative approach is kind of like to use interactions um, to maybe like if you have a very large network, it might not be sensible to try to show everything at the same time. So for example, if you have like a social network, um, frequently you maybe don't care so much about the global structure of the network, but you rather care about like, how am I connected to the rest of the world, right? Or how is my friend connected to me? So you might have more specific, uh, specific questions. And um, when you have these specific questions, there's like a lot of different visualization techniques that you could use. So here's one that we published a while ago. Um, this is about kind of like extracting, like here we have a network with 20,000 nodes and I'm showing a single one of them I run a query. And here I'm like querying for uh, my colleague, Mariah Maya. Uh, And so now I'm adding her node and her neighbors, which are in this case, this is an, uh, um, a bipartite network of authors and papers. And so we see now, this is the node of this person. And then we have all of these papers. Um, so we see the relationship of her to her papers, but now I can dynamically pull in more information. I can see, okay, there's this paper here. Uh, then we have, a, this paper has these co-authors, this person here, as these papers. And so we can kind of like keep drilling down and keep kind of like expanding dynamically our network in this way. Um, and so we can then also do things like maybe like make this person here the root and now study that network from that perspective. And so the idea here is that we have a complex network, we query on some important pieces of it. And then we use what in this case here, like a spanning tree algorithm um, and then missing edges are shown here on hover. So for example, this, uh, this paper here has a couple of co-authors that are also in this data set that we're looking at currently. And so we see that this person here was also a co-author of that paper by these kind of like links that are dynamically added. And there's more to this visualization, but we'll talk about these other aspects here on the right on, on Thursday. Um, I wanted to highlight this particular um, approach here um, because it's just such a cool idea. Um, so like we can do layouts um, as in a force directed layout, we usually have edges that are like crisscrossing at any angles, but sometimes it is useful to have orthogonal layouts where edges can only be kind of like um, horizontal or vertical. Um, and um, th these, these orthogonal layouts are computationally difficult to do. So, um, here on the, um, in the middle, you have kind of like a conventional algorithm pre-2015 that tried to do this orthogonal layout. On the left, you have a human layout for the same network. And I think everybody would agree that this layout here on the left is, is much, much better than the layout here in the middle because it's much more compact. We have shorter path and so on. And so it is just a much nicer layout. And then here on the right, we have this, um, this new algorithm that this group proposed. Um, and I want to kind of show, because I think the process is, is just so amazing how they did that. Um, and so what they did is they gave some initial layouts to people in a crowdsourced scenario. They, like, it was done on Mechanical Turk. And then they asked people to create the best possible layout with that network. Um, and then people created networks like this. So here you see that this person barely changed anything. Uh, but this person here, like the first ranked person, um, created a very nice, very efficient layout, right? So this is clearly much better layout for the same network than this here is. Uh, and so after they, they let people create those um, different layouts, they again use crowdsourcing uh, to ask people to rate which, are the, which of these networks are good. And that's how we came up with these ranks here. So we, had, we can see that like, um, people rank this network as, as bad, this network is bad, but these two networks here were ranked as, as very good. Um, and then they compare that to like use these kind of like, what are the good layouts? And then they characterize the, the properties of these layouts. And then they compared them to like the standard algorithm before they are on, and then to this new algorithm that they will be were developed based on kind of like what people thought are the best human layouts. Um, 
And I don't want to go into the details of the algorithm, but I, I just really think that this approach of giving something to the crowd, letting them try to do like an optimal layout for a human, then doing a second round of involving humans to judge which are the good layouts, and then using this to derive a, an algorithm is just really, really uh, smart in my opinion. Unfortunately, the algorithm that they came up with is fairly slow and I haven't really seen like a web-based implementation of it, but um, I'm still hopeful that they will eventually publish that. Um, back like three or four years ago when VR and AR were first becoming popular, I would have like every month somebody would write me an email or um, ask me about I have this cool idea for a startup. Network visualization is so important. Um, and why, like, it's so hard to visualize networks. Why don't we add additional dimension and do it in AR or VR? And, and there's people that actually develop these tools. And I was always very kind of like, let's say, hesitant and negative about it because, like, we've all talked about this plenty before. Why do we not visualize graphs in 3D? So we have plenty of problems that if we have a 3D scatter plot, all of these problems also are uh, also happen in, in, uh, in, um, for networks, but for networks, it's even worse because networks are like a node link layout. I can't like, I still have like a perspective on them. Like yes, depth, depth, depth detection is difficult, color, uh, occlusion, all of those things. But for networks, it's particularly like not smart to use uh, 3D because we can, uh, if we if we need to, if we can calculate a layout, we can calculate a layout that is optimal for the perspective we're looking at it. But if we calculate a layout in 3D, we can't calculate a layout that is optimal for each possible perspective that you're looking at it. Um, and so you always get into occlusion problems. And it doesn't help like at all. So just like for, for network visualization, for node length visualization, 3D just like doesn't make no sense at all. Okay, um, let's move on to, yeah, so 3D visualization, especially VR 3D visualization is still a little clumsy. I do think that there is some potential for it, right? Because some things like, for example, if you had a perfect headset, you could like even like, the simplest worst thing you could do is you could have like virtual 2D screens and you could arrange them and you could kind of like move them together and so on. So that there's there's certain things that would be cool um, and VR uh, like 3D uh, visualization tools. There's certain scenarios. So for example, as somebody at Ski for a show that for path tracing a 3D volume, um, you are much more efficient doing that with a VR headset than you are on a computer screen. But there, the data is inherently three dimensional, and so that makes a ton of sense. But for data that is abstract and not spatial at all, like a network, you don't want to use 3D. Okay, so the next piece that I want to talk about are styled or restricted layouts. Um, that like one common one is circular layouts. Um, and here, like in circular layouts, you kind of like have the problem that that tends to clutter fairly quickly. Um, the left figure here shows three percent of all possible edges, and the right figure here shows about six percent of all possible edges. And we see that this gets fairly cluttered. Um, you can kind of like try to optimize um, edge ordering or node ordering. Sorry. So that uh, nodes that are connected are close to each other. Um, and there's also some other smart things that you can do. So for example, you can do edge bundling. And so what you see here is um, this is like a, a software um, visualization where you have kind of like uh, individual functions or files here in the nodes. And then you have some kind of like packages here. So you have this hierarchy. And then on the outside, you have some kind of like higher level folder or, or, or sub module or something like that. So we have like this software package that has the three levels of hierarchy and the edges here show like function calls between these different modules. And so you can see that this here seems to be like a very like frequently used module that runs a lot of different function calls to these other modules. Um, and so, this is fairly cluttered, but what we can now do is we can create these nice edge bundles. Uh, 
Um, and so here, this is kind of like much, much cleaner now, right? We can see that there is from this module here at the bottom, there's like three major paths that kind of like go out like in this to this module, to this module and to this module. Um, and we can similarly see um, uh, these kinds of relationships uh, for these other modules. And so this is fairly clean. Uh, so how do we create that? That's kind of like looks cool, um, is a great idea. Uh, what's the idea behind this? And so the idea behind this is that we use um, the hierarchy um, to guide us. So think of it, um, maybe the best explanation here is like if I have the notes here and I want to connect this note, like this note but here, I'm not gonna just draw a straight edge, but I'm taking this hierarchy and flipping it inside. Um, and then I'm gonna trace my edge along the tree here. So I'm gonna start off here and then go to here, then go to here, then go to here, go to here, go to here, go to here. And now if I do the same thing to connect this node here to this node here, um, I, I start off here, then go here, here, and now I'm nicely bundled, right? I'm kind of running along this line up to this point here, and eventually I branch out again to that point. And so in this way, I get like these kind of connection highways and create these super nice bundles. Um, as you can imagine, um, like I don't have to perfectly go along the tree because that will also not be so, so, so useful. Um, but instead I'm like kind of running a spline between these connections as they do here. Um, and how exactly the spline fits to these points is what we call kind of like a damping or like an epsilon factor um, that kind of changes the, um, like how, how tightly something is bundled. And so, well, they call it beta here, um, bundling strength. Here you have a bundling strength of zero and here you have a bundling strength of one. And so you can see that the one bundling strength of one isn't all that useful, right? Because it essentially is this tree here, but something in between here, maybe like at 0 0.5 or 0 0.75 is kind of a useful bundling strength. It kind of cleans it up nicely, um, creates these highways, but it still makes these different, like the, the proportions here um, clear and easy to read. Um, and so this is kind of like implemented in, um, in D3. Uh, we can like change tension here dynamically um, and see how these bundlings, uh, the, the bundling strings dynamically changes uh, the appearance of that visualization. Um, you can also do this for like fixed layout, not only for style layouts. Um, and this, the idea here is that like, this is a map of the United States, could be something like migration or, or airline connections. Um, the idea here is that, um, well, we could also bundle these kinds of connections here. Um, and here we don't have um, a hierarchy. And so we can't use a hierarchy to route it. And what they're instead doing is um, a force directed approach for the line segments. So when there's lots of line segments close to each other, they, uh, they um, attract each other. Um, and that results in these kinds of layouts. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptic about these layouts because, um, well, it gets, well, it, it, it doesn't help that much in my opinion compared to this fairly clean layout we had earlier. This is also cleaner, but maybe that there's some unnecessary directions here. This like there's a sharp curve here that doesn't make a ton of sense. And so, um, yeah, you have to play with this. This is also computationally very expensive. This is like a fairly trivial algorithm, uh, but here you suddenly have force directed layouts for small line segments. Um, and so this gets, like, you, you have to do things like calculate this on a graphics card in parallel and so on. Um, okay, so one other concept I wanna talk about are super nodes and aggregation. Um, super nodes are um, kind of like, sometimes it makes sense to, like if you have a complicated network to not treat um, like every node separately. Think of it as let's say a collaboration graph between scientists. Um, you might have like all of the different scientists at the University of Utah, and then you might have lots of other scientists at the University of Denver. Um, and you might have like a lot of connections within these universities. But if you wanna study how well are Denver and Utah connected, you might wanna treat the 
universities as a node or maybe the department. And so you can say all of the people that are in that university or in the department, we can abstract them into a super node and, collect, uh, and collapse them. You can sometimes do that dynamically. Um, and you can create these manually or algorithmically, manually, like just selecting some nodes and collapsing them or based on data, like for example, categories, like I'm employee of that university, but it's also possible to create these um, kind of like super nodes um, algorithmically by just running a clustering algorithm and then um, visualize the clusters instead and only reveal the nodes on demand. And so you could kind of like um, doing something like that, you could have like a network as we see here with the black nodes. We could have simplified as to a network that is like very simple um, as you can see here on the right. And aggregation is, is kind of like a super powerful concept. So here we have another um, example of a spatial layout on the left, uh, how people move between different uh, districts in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, and this, this paper has a couple of cool uh, pieces in it. First um, is um, they, they show the edges only for selected regions, because in this example here earlier, you see that this is super, super busy, but maybe what I really care about is like New York, Chicago, and, uh, and, and Los Angeles. And I don't really care about the rest for my particular analysis question. And one way around that would be to only show uh, uh, edges for nodes that are in regions that you brushed like here. And then based on these brushes, like the green, the blue, the red uh, one here, they actually go further and abstract this into these super nodes. Um, and so now you see like, Montana, there's a lot of people moving within Montana, but there's also people moving from Montana to Arizona and from Arizona to Montana. In Washington, we have like a lot more people moving within Washington. We have a lot of people moving from New York to Florida, but also a lot of people moving within Florida. But there's, it looks like there's more people moving from New York to Florida than they are moving within Florida. And because we have now these abstract nodes, we can also show additional visualizations on top of them as we have here, these attributes. And so there's this video here um, that is really nice. I, I recommend you look at it, but I'm not gonna show it today in the interest of time. I kind of want to wrap up the um, explicit and node link representation and then keep like matrices and trees for like a later lecture. Okay, so let's recap a little bit. Um, explicit representations or node link diagrams the pros here are they are able to depict all different cl classes of graphs, including uh, that you can show hyper edges, um, you can show trees and so on. All of this works just really well. Um, you can customize your layouts by weighing the layout constraints. Um, and these explicit and not linked layouts are really the best um, layout for topology-based tasks. So if you wanna study connectivity between like uh, two particular nodes, you can path trace in a node link diagram manually fairly easily. You can see clusters. Um, and so they're, they're well suited for these topology based tasks um, if you have a good layout. So if you just have like, let's say a style layout where all the nodes are in a circle, then you might not see clusters. But if you have like an open layout, a free layout, then, uh, then you, you probably are, have a good shot at seeing clusters. Um, the negatives of these explicit representations, is it's, it's Kind of like an optimal layout is um, NP complete, um, but even these heuristics, like the nice spring embedder is fairly computationally expensive. And we have a tendency that these things clutter if the, no, if the networks are a little bit bigger. My, my rule of thumb is you don't wanna have more than 200 nodes in uh, a node link layout, otherwise, and, and with like a reasonably small number of edges. Otherwise you'll have very quickly the hairball problem. Okay, uh, instead of going into matrices, I'll like, take the last five minutes to take any questions you might have, and then we'll do multivariate networks on Thursday, um, and then continue on from there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Hi, I, I had a question. Yeah. Um, is it okay if we use uh, today's discussion for um, uh, like the discussion papers? Or yeah, you can use this as an activity today. Or activity, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>